Dear Lord, and I ask that you cleanse me and that you prepare me for this moment. And Father, as we open scripture and as we talk about the divine gospel, the revelation is a gospel that you may endow us with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And that as we go from verse to verse, that we may feel and begin to enjoy the journey we are. Lord, give me the ability to reflect that which you want to be reflected, to speak the way you want me to speak. And Lord, bless each one of us here today so that as we leave tonight, the beginning of Sabbath, we may glorify and say, Money is our Lord. And what a good one to be a son and a daughter of God. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to be passing your cards for questions and prayers. Okay. Perfect. All right. So um, you, you've got that chapter. You can read it afterwards or you can accompany me. I'm actually going to tell you where I'm going to be. So I'm going to be page number 10. This is our map I wanted to, to mm -hmm. look into that. So, um, what Revelation is about is probably jumbled and condensed in the first eight verses of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. In these eight verses, the introduction passage of Revelation, this is the introduction, introduction of Revelation as a letter, as a book, these eight verses. Um, they identify God as the author of Revelation. So who's the author of Revelation? And I'm talking about God the Father. So God the Father is the author of Revelation. God the Father is the one who speaks through his son. God the Father shows his people speaking through his son the things that will take place. It also introduces the book's author and its original recipients. And you will see that as we go through. Then it describes the central theme and purpose of the book and how it was written. And finally, it introduces the keynotes of the book. And so when you look at the book, the book in this chapter is split in those areas. The identity of God as author introduces the book's author and its original recipients, describes the central theme and purpose of the book, and then introduces the keynote of the book. And that is important. So let's go and, uh, and, and visit the central theme of Revelation. And so we're now going to go to Scripture. We're going to read Revelation 1, verses 1. And what does Revelation 1, 1 says? It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant God. As you read this verse, you can, you can begin to see God has a message, gives it to his son, Jesus, who then produces, gives it to his angel, who gives it to the apostle John in Moss, and he writes it down. Very much what it says. So, uh, the opening statement found in Revelation 1 1 A, by the way, I, I, I've divided Revelation 1 1 into three sections A, B, and C. The opening statement found in Revelation 1 1 A, which is the sentence, the revelation of Jesus Christ, provides the title of the book. So, what's the book? The revelation. The revelation of whom? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. The Greek word used for revelation, apocalypsis, that's how it, uh, how it is written, or uh, apocalypsi, which is how it is pronounced. And by the way, in my language, 
read in the in Romanian, in Portuguese, in Romanian, in Spanish, in a lot of languages, there is no such thing as revelation. Uh, the, the, the revelation is called apocalypse. Right. But it's one and the same meaning. And I, I think that's important for us to understand. So the Greek word apocalypse means unveiling. It means uncovering. It means revealing. That's the word revelation. That's really what it means. And this means that revelation or apocalypse is the unveiling or the revealing of the of Jesus Christ, which is really what revelation is all about. It's all about Jesus Christ. Please note that in, in the original language, the phrase a revelation of Jesus Christ may mean either the, uh, that the revelation is from Jesus or that the revelation is about Jesus as one revealed or, which I believe is the, is, is the, the factual case, in a sense, it represents both. So it is the revelation from Jesus about Jesus, given by our God the Father. And I think that's important. So Revelation 1-1a goes on to say, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave him. Okay. Gave, gave to Christ. The statement clearly indicates that the revelation came from God to the Father through Jesus Christ, who communicated, um, who communicated it to John through an angel. Revelation 1 1 states that, if you, if you go to your verse, Revelation 1 1 states that, and he, Jesus, sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. That's the last statement of, of verse 1 1. Revelation 22 16 confirms what we have just read in Revelation 1 1. And so here's what Revelation uh, 22 16 says I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. This is a verse full of pregnancy. It's pregnancy meaning, really is. Note what the verse says. This entire book, this letter, is relevant for all the churches. It's relevant for our church, right here, in Laguna Niguel. It's relevant for all the churches. Jesus is both the ancestor and the descent of David. Why is he the ancestor? Because he created David. Why is he the descendant? Because when he came to earth, and put on the, the, the human mental, he came from the line of David. Can you see it? Perfect, perfect description. And um, Messianic king, so in other words, descendant of David, the Messianic king, and he is a member of the God Adam. The rest of the book testifies that Jesus is the main subject of its content. It tells us in Revelation 22.13, that I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That means that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, Jesus is the A to Z of the book's content. He is the beginning and the end. <clears throat> These passages of Scripture clearly indicate that the book of Revelation begins and concludes with Jesus. He is the beginning, he is the middle, and he is the end. He is all about Jesus. The statement, um, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which, which we read a little while ago, shows that the primary focus of the uh, apocalypse, or revelation, is Jesus Christ. He is the key, that's the true meaning of the book. By naming his book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, John, the inspired author, wanted to tell the reader that the book he wrote offers a unique portrayal of Christ that is not found elsewhere in the scripture. Revelation, 
regarding Jesus is very different. And we will be discussing that. We are going to go through there. Okay? So, the book of Revelation is also a gospel. How many gospels do we have in scripture? Five. Five is perfect with Revelation. So we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Revelation. These are five, five gospels. Perfect. So, so uh, the four gospels of Revelation talk about the same Jesus. I want you to pay attention. However, they focus on different aspects of Jesus' roles and existence. You see, the four Gospels portray Jesus as the pre-existent Son of God or entered into human experience to save fallen human beings and who after his death on the cross and sub subsequent resurrection, he did what? Ascended to heaven. Revelation unveils what Jesus is doing in heaven now, right now. You see, the book reveals that after Jesus' ascension to heaven, and by the way, that's how every one of the four Gospels ends, with his ascension. So after Jesus' ascension into heaven, Jesus was seated on the heavenly throne and in our rules over the entire universe. Ooh, this is powerful. He's now king and ruler. Not only of all this earth, but the universe. The Gospels also tells, tells us that before Christ's ascension, Jesus made two promises about his future interaction with his people. First, that he will always be with us. Let's read it, Matthew 28, 20. This is what he says. And lo, I am with always, even to the end of age. Secondly, that Jesus will come again to take us home, to take us home to himself. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Uh, we're now at the beginning of page 12. This is what it says. Let not your heart be troubled. He's talking to you and to me. This is Jesus' word. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you, you may be also. What an incredible promise that Jesus makes to you and to me today. The book of Revelation picks up on these two promises. See, I, I want you to understand how significant Revelation is. And describes how Jesus fulfilled the promise he made that he would be with these people throughout history, even to the end. The first 18 chapters of Revelation is all about a description that fulfills the promise he made that he would be with his people throughout his history. That's how important it is. You know, I just wish that people out there that call themselves Christians would understand how revelation is so important to understand how Christ and see. First 18 chapters. The, the, remainder, the remainder chapters, chapter 19 to 22, describes how Jesus will come at the conclusion of this world's history to be united with his people. That's, that's also important. See, without revelation, our knowledge of Christ's ministry in heaven on behalf of his people would be vain. We would really know what he's doing for you and for me right now in heaven. We wouldn't know that. It's just that important. And so it conveys the substance of the gospel as the good news. Revelation is the gospel. The gospel of good news, and in the full sense of the word, it emphatically points to the glorified Christ as the one who, by virtue of his own death, conquered death on the grave. So let's remind ourselves of those of, of that scripture. Revelation, 
chapter 1, verses 17 and 18 says, Do not be afraid. He says to you and to me, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have had the keys of Hades and of death. What an assurance. Not only is he alive, but he controls life and death in many regards. He's got the keys. It tells us that Jesus will never forsake his people. That's what those verses tell me. It tells me that he will always be with them until he comes the second time to take them to himself. So yes, sometimes we go through crucibles and hardships and difficult journeys. And it's tough out there. But don't ever doubt that God is with you. That Jesus is with you. So do not be afraid. So do not be afraid. It's for us. All right. So let's go into verse 1, 1, B. And now we're going to talk about the purpose of the book of Revelation. So that's the, the middle section of verse, of verse, chapter 1, verse 1. The opening statement uh, or opening verse, Revelation 1, 1, B states that the purpose of revelation is to show God's people. Let's read it. The things which must soon take place, says that verse. This statement tells us that the portrayal of future events occupies much of the book. We now want to talk about things that are happening today and will continue to happen until it comes. Future events. Okay? When we read and study Revelation, we see that the first half of Revelation, chapters 1 to 11, delineates worldwide events that take place between the first century and the end of time. That's really, really imperative for us to understand that. And the second, the second half of Revelation, chapters 12 to 22, deals primarily with the time of, of the end, and it's leading to the second coming. And this is all important. If it seems all scripture is because you and I need to become aware of it. We need to know about it. This division suggests the, the question, how can the book be both the unveiling of Jesus Christ and the unveiling of events that will take place? How is it possible that this book may have all these two elements together? Well, for one, the prophecies of Revelation explain from God, God's perspective why the predicted events will take place. You see, these events provide assurance that no matter what the future brings, God is in control. So COVID-19 happened, but God is in control. You may have a major earthquake tomorrow, God is in control. There may need to be a hurricane. On the other side, God is in control. And we've got to believe that. And that, it also tells us that whatever he does, accomplishes God's plans and purpose for this world. And that's where we often go off the band. Because we look at these things and we ask, so who is God? Instead of saying, ah, it could just be that the birth pains are intensified. Read Matthew. Read Matthew about the birth pains. Matthew 24, 25. Could it be that it is intensified? And I think this is, this is important. However, the primary purpose of the future events predicted in Revelation, and I think it's important. Um, however, um, whether these already uh, fulfilled or these yet to be to, to take place is to assure us of Jesus' presence with these people throughout history and its final events. And I think that's really something that is so difficult for us to understand. We are going to experience more and more as we come to, G to, to the day Jesus appears, more and more pain and trouble. 
And what Revelation is telling you and me is that that's part of the journey. But God, you, and he's with me. And I think that's important for us to understand. So, I also want to make this observation. Future events are ev evidently not the primary theme of Revelation. They're not. If they were, you would have a significant section of future events. God would be telling you what's coming out. It's not. They are not recorded to make the apocalypse a divine fort fortune-telling book. There are quite a lot of books out there about that sort of a thing. Nor are these prophecies given to satisfy our obsessive curiosity about the future. The reality is that Christ knew that the full impact of his promises to be with his people would not be effective without unpacking future events through his prophecies um, or through his prophetic word. These future events are designed to impress on us the seriousness of the final crisis. And I will need to depend on God during this time. See, that's really what God expects from you and, and from me as we walk towards his coming. It's for dependence on God. Okay. So, this time of crisis will remind God's people of Christ's promise to be with them. In order to sustain them during these difficult times, John 16, verses 4 tells us, John 16, 4, These things I have told you, Jesus said, that when they, the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So when the big stuff happens, remember that God told you that they would be coming. Note, we must keep in mind that the fulfillment of end time prophecies must not be a subject of spe speculation and sensationalism. Revelation informs us about what will happen in the world at the time of the end. What the book does not show us is exactly when and how the end time events will take place. And that is important for us to understand. All right. As the Bible states, the matter of the unfolding of the final events are, uh, are secrets God has reserved only for himself. That's read scripture. Matthew 24, 36. Here's what the Lord says. But of the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Does Jesus know when he's coming? No. Yeah, according to scripture. So who's the only one that knows? The Father. So remember, nobody else. And if someone is going to say to you, you know, I have a feeling that Jesus is coming in 2026. You better take that verse of Matthew 24, 36 and say to that person, have you read scripture? Okay. Let's read Acts chapter 1, verse 7. And yes, yes, what the Lord says. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, if you ask me, Is the Lord coming soon? I'm going to say to you, Yes. And the reason is that he now wants to what I have seen has degraded significantly. And the wars and the troubles have augmented significantly. But my father was a pastor. And he preached for many a year. And he believed that he was going to see this, the Lord come. And the Lord did not come in his own time. Well, I'm hoping that he's going to come in my own time. But if he doesn't, should I be sad and disappointed? In a sense, yes. Because that means that I probably didn't do as much as I could do to warn the, the world about Jesus and that is coming. But in a sense, I shouldn't. Because only the Father knows 
when is the right time to come for us? As the Bible tells us, the timing and manner of the unfolding of the final events will be clear to us only when they are fulfilled, not before. John chapter 14, verses 29, here's what it says. And now I have told you before it comes, that does come to pass, you may believe. So when things come and you can see them, you're going to believe it because the, God told you. John 16, 4 tells us, but these things I have told you, so when the time comes to pass, or I, I've just read that. When understood properly, the prophecies of Revelation have practical purposes. And we are going to spend a little time on this. These prophecies have been given to us to teach us how to live today and to prepare us for all the future. So what, what's, what's the purpose of the, prophet, the prophecies? To teach us how to live now and for the remainder of the time we have, and to prepare us for the future. And how significant is that? It is essential. We need to prepare ourselves to meet God and to become part of his family. Studying these prophecies should make us better people, should motivate us to take serious our eternal destiny, and should inspire us to try to reach people around us with the gospel message. All right, now let's go to the last sentence of chapter 1, verse 1. We're still in verse 1, right? So this is uh, Revelation 1, 1, the last verse. The opening statement, opening verse, Revelation 1, 1, C, I call it C, which is the last verse, further explains that the contents of Revelation were sent and signified by his angel to his servant John in a vision. So the angel provided this to John in a vision. And this is important for us to understand. The Greek word, semeno, which is used here for signify, means primarily to show by signs or symbols. So John receives a vision with signs and symbols. Important. This is the same word used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the, Sept the Septuagint, where Daniel, in Daniel 2.45, explained uh, explain to King Nebuchadnezzar that by means of a symbol, the statue made of gold and silver and gold, bronze and iron uh, uh, that had shown to the king uh, what would take place in the future. And you've got, you've got that word on the list that I've given you. I think it's uh, probably page two, the beginning of page two. Here's what that verse says. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation is sure. So, Daniel had a dream. The Apostle Paul, John had a dream. And in both dreams, they were given a vision. Very important. The Greek, um, uh, the Greek words, semeno, uh, signifies we, we've already gone that way. And then, similarly, the implying by employing this word in the opening statement of Revelation, John the Revelator informs the reader that the things recorded in the book were shown to him on Patmos in vision using symbols. Ah, we need to understand that clearly. Please note that the book of Revelation does not provide photographic descriptions of heavenly realities. It doesn't. For future events that should be interpreted literally, it just doesn't. Although the scenes and events predicted are real, they were shown to John in symbolic presentation. You're going to know why I'm repeating this a couple of times. This is important. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John faithfully recorded these symbolic presentations exactly as they were shown to him. As we read in Revelation chapter 1, verses 2, we now move to... Um, to, uh, to verse 2, um, John, uh, it says, John, 
who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So John bore witness to the word of God and to and the, te and the testimony of and the testimony to Jesus Christ to all the things that, that he saw, to the symbols that he saw. However, due to the inadequacy of human language, John added symbols of his own as he described what he saw. You and I need to be aware of that. His attempts of putting heavenly realities in human words are deleted uh, by marker words such as like this or as this or that sort of a thing. So please note, it is important to keep the symbolic character of Revelation in mind. This will safeguard us against the literal application of symbols which would distort the prophetic message. Study Revelation calls for a symbolic understanding of the scenes and events recorded. We've got to read and study what, what, what is recorded. However, it is not easy to determine what should be understood symbolically and what should be understood literally in Revelation. And we're going to give you a couple of examples. Some symbols are defined in the book. Here are some examples. Revelation 120. I'm not going to read the verse, but I'm going to tell you the symbols that are recorded there. The seven stars, which tells us these are exactly the angels of the seven churches. In that verse, it also talks about the seven lampstands. What are the seven, seven uh, lampstands? The seven churches. Okay. In verse 12, 9, uh, the symbols that I mentioned there is the dragon, the great dragon, which is the devil and or Satan. Okay. In the Revelation chapter 17, verses 9, 11, 9 to 11 and 15, that it talks about the seven heads. And the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And the woman in Revelation is a church. And if the, and if it talks about seven seven miles or seven mountains, where is that church? I'm gonna tell you in Rome. You, we, we're gonna study that later on in Rome. But I'm going to leave it to that. I'm not going to go, go any further than that. And then it talks about seven kings. So the five fallen kings are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Middle Persia, and Greece. And the sixth is Rome, the kingdom during John's time. And the seventh, what is the seventh? In that verse, verse, verse 11, it says, Beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to prediction. Ooh, this is so powerful, powerful, because the beast described not only is a church, a, a, a system, a church system that is part of the seven eons, but that, that beast will ride a partner beast that is currently being made in this country. And we will study that in Revelation. This is important. This is very important that we understand. So Revelation, uh, Revelation 17, 11, the waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So these symbols are very real in the book of Revelation. And they provide me. So in other words, John, through what he, he saw, describes what these are. Okay. But most symbols, however, are not defined either. They just not. Therefore, in trying to determine the meaning, we must be careful not to impose a meaning on the text that comes out of allegorical imagination or from current meanings of those symbols. Symbols of the past may have changed symbols now. When was this written? In the first century. Where are we now? 
the 21st century. Over 2 million or 2 million years separates us. 2000. I mean, 2000. Two, thank you. Where 2000 it? years separates us. And in 2000 years, descriptions change. I think that that's why we let the Bible interpret itself. Yes, and that's what we do. Okay. And that's exactly what we do. But that's why it is important for us to, to, uh, to go through this. So, um, in dealing with uh, the, the symbols in Revelation, we must keep in mind that Revelation was written almost 2,000 years ago. I've just mentioned that to the Christians uh, of John's time. As we read in Revelation 1, Revelation 1.11, John was asked to write what he saw in a book and to send copies of it to the seven churches that are in Asia. Which are these churches? These were real churches, by the way, in Asia. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Therefore, the symbolic language of Revelation is that of the first century, and we've got to be sensitive to that. So as we study Revelation today, we must determine the meaning of those symbols and the meaning that they, the symbols had for the original recipients. This will safeguard us against our natural tendency to impose on the symbols of Revelation meanings that coincide with our time and our situation. It is important to understand that the symbolic language of Revelation is not born in a vacuum, but that it was drawn from historical reality. Most of symbolism of Revelation was taken from the Old Testament. We're going to have the, the opportunity to, to see that as we go through. Some reports of the book's text has direct or indirect allusions to the Old Testament. Very important that you understand that. In portraying future events, inspiration often uses the language of the past. God wants to impress upon our minds that his acts of salvation in the future will be much like his acts of salvation in the past. What he did for his people in the past, he will do for them, for us, now, in the future. There is no doubt that first century readers of Revelation would have understood most of the symbols in Revelation in light of their Old Testament background. Thus, in unlocking the meaning of the symbols and images in Revelation, we must first um, pay attention to the Old Testament. And it's very important. You know, this is why we believe that the entire scripture, sola scriptura, which includes 66 books, Old Testament and the New Testament, are very important for us to read and to study. And that is relevant. Please note that many symbols, are, yeah, many symbols in the book of Revelation, such as beasts, heads, horns, stars, the four winds of, of the earth, women, as we even, uh, um, as even that, has even added dragons um, and so on were also widely used in the Jewish apocalyptic writings of the time. So these things to the first century were not odd. People understood those signs. As such, these symbols were very much a part of the people's vocabulary in the first century. In addition, Revelation's images would have also uh, evoked contemporary Greek or Roman scenes in the midst of the first century Christians. So John didn't receive images that him and his contemporaries were not um, you know, familiar with. Important that, that we, we understand. Ellen G. White in the Acts of the Apostle, page 585, and this is a sentence, so I don't have that to show you, but it's a sentence, notes that in the book of Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. So Revelation is the bucket. It is, if you like, the plate where everything comes in and stays. Everything moves in and stays in the book of Revelation. 
All right. Um, all right, let's move to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. This is the blessings to the reader and those who hear Revelation. I hope so far that this makes sense, guys. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. By the way, when you read your book to, to, tomorrow, you're going to say, boy, that's what he said. Yeah, because that's what I'm doing. I'm using that book. Okay. Revelation 1, 3. Revelation 1, 3 promises a special blessing to those who read and hear the words of the prophetic message. This is for you and for me, and please pay attention. Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep these things which are written in it. For the time is near. What does it mean when it says for the time is near? God is at the door. It's applicable to us. It's applicable to you and to me. Exactly. Please note, the word blessed, or makarios, which is the, the, the Greek word here, means happy. Happy. This is the same word that Jesus used in the Sermon of the Mount. When you read Matthew chapter 3, verses 12, makarios is used to really explain or express happiness in the Sermon of the Mount. Um, it, it really a reference to the deeper inner joy that nobody and nothing in life can take away when we become ch children of God, which in part the Sermon of the Mountain reflects. As we read in John 16, 22, John 16, 22, here's what it says. This is Jesus speaking. You now have sorrow, says Jesus. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And your joy, no one will take away from you. You now have sorrow. And let's face it, we all have sorrow. We all go through the crucible of life. But he says, but I will see you again. So when I come for, for you, I'm going to see you again. I'm going to come for you. When I come for you, your heart will rejoice. And your joy, no one will take away. Wow. These are encouraging, encouraging. So you see, God's blessing makes the faithful happier through the hardships of life because they know that there is an end to sorrow and hardship. Likewise, the readers of Revelation are promised, uh, uh, are promised the spiritual happiness when they observe the instructions spe specified in the prophetic word. As you read Revelation 1 3, please note this. Uh, the change in the text form. I want you to read that first sentence. Notice, no, notice what it says. It says, blessed are the one who reads. That seems to me a singular. Isn't that singular? And then continue that sentence. And those who hear the words of this prophecy. That's plural. Now, what's the meaning of that? Mm. See, this change in text suggests a public reading of Revelation in a church setting. How many times has anybody read Revelation in a church setting? Don't answer. Don't answer. But it's a job. There is a meaning for it. It's significant. Those who hear are the listeners. This is the congregation assembled to hear the biblical reading of Revelation's prophecies. That's really what it says in verse 3. Okay? Therefore, the study of Revelation envisions individuals in the church who are appointed by God to make the prophecies of Revelation understandable to the congregation. That's the singular. Okay? Blessed is the one who reads. Okay? However, this, however, does not suggest that the book is intended to be studied by only a few individuals. Rather, Revelation should be studied by the whole body of believers. When believers understand the prophecies of Revelation and respond by taking these prophecies to heart, a great blessing comes upon them. And it, it, this should be, should be understood by us. We're talking about a good news, a gospel where Jesus is preparing a place for us and will come for you and for me 
to gather his family together. Okay. All right. Let's look at the Trinitarian greetings of Revelation. This is very nice. Who's involved in all this? And how is this greeting transferred to you? And who provides greeting? And what is the greeting? That's really what it is. So, verses 4 to 6 of Revelation. 4 to 6. So, let me get to where we are. Okay. So, let's read this. And then let's unpack it. Revelation 1, 4 to 6. From him who is and who was and is to come. I'm really starting uh, um, somewhere uh, halfway in verse 4. From him who is and who was and is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So Revelation um, 1, uh, 4 introduces the sender and the recipients of this letter. Revelation uh, chapter 1, verses 4a, the very first sentence of 4, says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. This statement indicates that the Apostle John, who is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, was the sender. So the Apostle John is writing the letters and is going to duplicate those seven different letters to seven different churches. Yeah. John was the one writing. Uh, 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 writing to seven Christian congregations in the Roman province of Asia. Okay, this is currently the southwestern part of Turkey. I have had the privilege of seeing the ruins of these churches. Okay, so these churches were the recipients um, of the epistolar letter which John wrote, and we're talking about the book of Revelation. It is important to note that this epistolar letter was sent by God through Jesus and written by John because these churches were in dire spiritual circumstances that threatened to destroy their existence as God's people. So why, why did John, why did God instructed or gave it to Jesus and, and Jesus gave it to an angel and instructed John to write these letters? Because the churches of the time were in dire straits of being destroyed. And that's really significant. So please note, in Revelation, those seven churches represent the church throughout uh, the Christian age. In Scripture, the number seven also has symbolic, symbolic meaning. So chapter, the, the, these were sent to seven churches, but it has a great symbolic meaning. It is the number of fullness and completeness. So in a sense, the message applies to all churches. This, thus, although originally Revelation was written to those churches, Revelation was also written for all God's people throughout the Christian age. And that's important for us to understand. Revelation 1, 4, this is the sentence that follows. The second part of, of the latter's opening gives the common Epistolary greeting among the early Christians. Here's, here's John's greeting. Grace and peace to you. By the way, uh, Paul used that in Romans. Peter used that in Peter. So this was normal for the time. And But what does that, that mean? Uh, this gives common... Uh, what does this mean? Note the phrase. The phrase consists of the customary... Uh, customary uh, Customary uh, Greek greeting word carries, and carries is grace. And the Hebrew greeting word shalom, which is peace. Carries shalom. That's really what it was. So in the New Testament, grace and peace is more than just a casual greeting when it comes together, particularly. See, the order of these two words is always grace and peace, never peace and grace. Always grace and peace. 
and I think it's important. Um, Bruce uh, Metzger, and he's a scholar, a religious scholar, points out that this is so because grace is the divine favor bestowed upon human beings. Who bestows upon human beings the divine favor? God. Okay, so God is first, always first. Grace. Okay. And peace is the state of spiritual being which follows grace. Once you feel God's grace, what's your natural status? Peace. That's the salutation. As we continue to read Revelation 1 4 and, and the remainder of, uh, uh, of 1 4 uh, C to 6, we see that the givers of grace and peace, those who pronounce grace and peace, are the three parts of the Godhead. Three parts of the Godhead. So let's look at this carefully. Let's, let's look at it again. Uh, verse 4, the, the, the end of verse 4. From him, who is and who was and is to come, and who's that? From him, that's God the Father. From him, who is, who was, and is to come, God the Father. Okay? And from the seven, who are the seven spirits? That's the Holy Spirit, who are before the throne. We, we're going to unpack that. And from Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the third member of the Godhead. All right. So scripture tells us here that the first member of the Godhead mentioned is God the Father. He, he is referred to as the one who is and who was and is to come. We see this designation for God the Father in the following verses. So in other words, is there anywhere else in, in scripture this sort of this sort of realignment? Yeah. Revelation chapter one, verses eight. See what it says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, says the verse. All right. And Revelation 4 8, what does Revelation 4 8 say? The four living creatures, which having six wings, were full of armies around with and within. And they do not Rest day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord of Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So when you read that, you know that's that's who God the Father is. This tripartite title used for God the Father, that is the divine name. I am who I am, which in uh, which interpreted the Old Testament covenant name Yahweh. And you remember, remember when God met Moses at the burning bush, and Moses says, who are you? What do I say to Pharaoh? I am who I am. All right. All right. Exodus 3.14. Well, I, I'll just read that for you. As we read in Revelation 1, 4, 6, the second person of the Trinity of the Godhead is called the seven spirits who are before the throne. I really hope that you, you will, you, you'll get a, a great feeling about the Holy Spirit when we do, what we do with this. In Revelation 4, um, um, this name refers, by the way, to the Holy Spirit, with seven being a number of fullness. In Revelation chapter 4, 5 and chapters 5, verses 6, we see this designation for the Holy Spirit repeated. Revelation 4, 5. And from the throne proceeded lightning, says Revelation 4, 5. Thundering and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. See? It really reinforces what you're reading in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 5 says, it says, And I look and be heard in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders to the land, as though it had been slain, having seven horns. 
which are the seven spirits of God sent out with all the earth. God's spirit present with Christ. Ooh, Can you talk a little bit about why it's seven? Well, um, uh, let, let me give you a little, a little information and we, we got that. Okay. If the Old Testament, uh, in, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 11, 2, this is a great verse. I can tell you. So, because you, when you ask the question, so what is the only, what's the, the spirit composed of? What, what is this all about? Seven what? And what is seven entitled to? Okay. So, so, um, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 11, 2, God through the prophet Isaiah identifies the seven spirits that really form the entire Holy Spirit and what the Spirit is all about. That establishes the Holy Spirit identity. Okay? So the, the so let's let's read what uh, Isaiah eleven two has to say before I move any further. Are we making progress? I'm hoping that we are. Isaiah 11.2, page 3, midway through, 11.2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel okay. and might, okay. mighty, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And so the seven spirits that come in that verse, there are spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and strength, spirit of knowledge and godliness, the spirit of the fear of God, seven spirit. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit is. And I want to look at you and me and you ask the question. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, godliness, fear of God. That's holiness. That's godliness. But Isaiah 11 2 doesn't mention godliness. No, no, it doesn't. Godliness, yeah, godliness is part of of the uh, uh, what he is. of what it is. But also that number seven is the complete, completion. So the completeness Correct. of the Holy Spirit is all those things. Correct. And I was going to, I was going to make that statement. Thank you. So, if for, to Barger's question, these are the elements, and that means fullness, completeness. By the way, that's what seven is. Whenever you see seven in scripture prophetically mentioned, it is completeness and fullness, fulfillment and completeness, completeness and fullness. There are meanings to seven. There are meanings to three. Meanings to ten. Meanings to there is a, there are meanings to a, a variety of numbers in scripture. Okay, so in Revelation, the seven spirits parallel the seven churches in which the spirit operates. Woo! We're talking about seven churches. What are we talking about? Us human beings as part of God's church, God's God's people. We should be reflecting. Wisdom and understanding and counsel and strength and knowledge and, you know, godliness and the fear of God. That's really what it says. So the identity, the seven spirits, denotes the fullness and universal, uh, universality of the Holy Spirit's work in the churches, enabling the church to fulfill the calling. So when, whenever we have a prayer week, just like we did, and we ask God to send us the Holy Spirit and the revival. That's what it means. Okay. As we read in Revelation chapter 1, 5, and 6, we're moving forward. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go quicker now. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The last Trinitarian greetings is provided by the third member of the Godhead. Who's that? Jesus Christ. So the Father provided the greeting, the Holy Spirit provided the greeting, and so Jesus does so. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it reads as follows. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, 
to him who loves us and washed us from our sins in his one blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The verse identifies Christ in three titles. Revelation 1.5a says that Jesus is identified as being the faithful witness, as being the firstborn from the dead, as being the ruler of the kings of the earth. These, the, these three titles echoed Psalm 80, 89, in which the Davidic the, the, the king is identified as Psalm 89, verses 27, as the firstborn of Yahweh and the exalted king on earth, and Psalm 89, 37, as the faithful witness for Yahweh. These three titles of Jesus correspond to his titles of prophet, priest, and king. Okay. By virtue of Jesus' faithful witness during his temporary stay on earth, Jesus has received the honor of the firstborn. God calls his son the firstborn. Which has been exalted to the highest rank above all powers and authority in heaven and on earth. If you just, Ephesians chapter 1 verses, I mean chapter 1 verses 20 and 22, and this is in your notes towards the end of page number 3. Ephesians 1 20, 22 uh, says, uh, God's, God's mighty power, he actually, uh, this, you know, verse 19 talks about God's mighty power, so I'm saying, God's mighty power, verse 20, worked in Christ when God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So his mighty power has begun and will continue forever. That's really what it said. Verse 22. And God put all things under his feet and gave him to be had over all things to the church. He's king. He's in charge. He's the ruler. Okay. First Peter 3.22 says, Who has gone into heaven? Jesus Christ, which is a preamble, who has gone into heaven and is at the right end of God, angels and authorities and powers, it having been made subject to him. Everything is subject to him. By the way, he's sitting, he's seated where? Where is Jesus currently seated? On the throne. On the throne. The right hand. At the right hand of God the Father. Who's ruling? Yeah. Having stated who Jesus truly is, John then describes what Jesus does. And this is important for you and for me. He tells us in Revelation 1, 5, 6 that Jesus loves us. That he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that he made us a kingdom. And made us priests to his God and Father. So when somebody asks you, who are you? What should you be saying? I'm a son or a daughter of God. I'm part of his kingdom, and I'm a priest to the God, my, my father. That's the way it is. See, this threefold activity of Jesus corresponds to his three titles in the original text. text. See, Jesus loves us, indicates an ongoing activity. He didn't say he loved or he will love. He says, Jesus loves us, indicates an ongoing activity. He loves us continually. The love embraces equally the past, the present, and the future. The one who loves has set us free from our sins by his blood. That's proof of his love. In the original text, the verb to set free or to release 
refers to the complete act of the past. On the cross, Jesus died and released us from our sins forever. That is how much he loves you and me. Revelation tells us not only what Christ has done for us, but also what he became in him. Revelation chapter 5, 10. <laughs> we, we are told in Revelation 5, 10. Uh, do I have it here? Oh, there it is. And that made us a kingdom and priests to our God. That's what it says. This is the status that redeemed the redeemed enjoy because of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Yes, Mark. When I think of kings and priests, what what are they responsible for and who they are they responsible to? And if you think about kings and priests, they're both responsible for God. Right. But they're also responsible for their flocks or the people in their kingdom. Absolutely right. And so I see this as, as an important job description. If we're going to be kings and priests, we're accountable personally to God, but we're also responsible for our fellow man. Absolutely. That is absolutely. This is why we need to understand that not only are we part of a kingdom, but we have the responsibility to engage others. And that's really what you're saying, Barbara. Mm -hmm. And see if they also join, join us in the kingdom that God has created. Is this in heaven? Us. Is this in Right now. This is now. Right now. So God is in heaven, but we are not no. in heaven. No, correct. Right now. We will have that forever. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. So it's right now for us. What's that? Say it again. The title is right now for us. The title. Yes. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. means high responsibility. High responsibility. Yeah, That's yeah. why Barbara uh, made the comment that she made. But it's right. easier to imagine king and priest to God. Maybe priest to those who serve, but king to those who serve. I guess king dumb, not king. King dumb and priest. Kingdom and priest. But if, if you think about what a king is responsible for, sure. sure. They're, stuck, they're sure. responsible for assuring sure. that their fellow man is well cared for. Sure, but we need to understand the king is Christ. Christ. The kingdom are we together as he formed us. But we are priests. And the priestly function is to reach out and to bring in. That's really what it is. Okay. So. The status was originally promised to ancient, by, by the way, Revelation tells us not only that Christ has done what done, has done for us, but also what we become in him. I think that's important. In Revelation 5.10, and we read that, Christ has made us a kingdom and priests to his God, uh, a kingdom and priests to his God in the Father. This status was originally promised to ancient Israel. So this is not you. And I, you're going to read it in scripture. Because God loved Israel. He redeemed them from the slavery of Egypt. And promised that they would be his kingdom of priests. Exodus, read with me. Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. Exodus 19. We should be on page 4 now. Mm -hmm. Let's read that. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That promise is part of the covenant. And it's interesting that it's made... It's clear, just like it makes it clear in Revelation. So it's Correct. Obeying, like you it's conditional. It's conditional. Then you will be the king. Correct. But let's let's now go to, to the New Testament. 
As we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, this privileged title is now offered to the Christian church as the true Israel of God. Well, what does it say? 1 Peter 9 and 10. But you are the chosen generation. It's talking about you and I. You are the chosen generation. It says, a royal priesthood. See, in the kingdom, there is a king. And if king is our Lord and Savior, okay, we are priestly royalty. Right? It goes on and says, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now had obtained mercy. See, mercy and peace. Can you see? You are not, but you are not. You are not because through what I did in Calvary for you, and you've accepted in faith of what I did, you are now my people. And a holy nation which means set aside. Exactly. Holy nation. What I love here is that God says, you're not American. You're not Russian or, you know, Hispanic or any of that. You actually belong to a new country. It's my country, my kingdom. So you can put that other stuff behind because that's the ways of the world. You belong to something better now. Right. All right, what Israel was offered as a, as a future promise is now offered to Christians on the basis of what Christ did in the past. And this is important. What is he doing in, in heaven today for you and for me? That's part of what he's doing. Promises of the past, realities in the future, realities in the present. Okay. So, because of Christ's ongoing love, the redeemed are already elevated to the glorious status of a king and a new priest. Today, now, right here. And that's that's important as we read as we read in Revelation 5 10. Paul explains in Ephesians uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, and we read uh, that the redeemed are already raised and made to sit with Christ in the heavenly places. This is what the verse says. And God raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, this is possible right now, right here. And that's what we need to understand. While we were elevated to the status of a kingdom and priests, we must keep in mind that we are still in the world. And although in the world, we do not have to Listen to scripture, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20, Philippians 3.20. For, what does it say? You should know it by heart. For our citizenship is what? In heaven. Is in heaven. From which we also eagerly do what? Pray for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But when does that citizenship begin? Amen. Here now, when I give my heart to God and have become a, a member of his kingdom and a priest for God. All right, the last section of uh, this presentation. I know this has been pretty long. I warned you that it was going to be an hour and a half. Warned you. Time is flying. Come, the time is flying. All right. The last two verses. This is the keynote of the book of Revelation. By the way, you need to know this because uh, this is what the book of Revelation is going to be all about. It's a keynote. It's it's uh, it's fundamental to to the understanding of Scripture. Verses seven and eight. So, what do verses seven and eight of Revelation say? Behold, it begins with behold. Jesus is coming with clouds. Oh, what is that? You should know. What are the clouds? Angel. He's coming with all the angels. So much so that Adam, at the, at the time, is void of any movement. Um, this, this, is, this is magnificent. By the way, I'm quoting a little bit of Ellen White. No, but th this is what it is. So let's go back and read it. 
Behold, Jesus is coming in clouds, and every eye will see him. It doesn't matter why, whether it's here or on the other side of the world, whether they have sunshine and we have night, we only see him. All of us at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> And every eye will see him, even they who, who pierced him. Why? Because they will know that what they did was wrong. Even uh, Caiaphas, Jesus hmm? says, you will see the Son of God coming in glory at the right hand of the Father. Hmm? God's not a liar. Right. So apparently there's a special resurrection. There's a special resurrection. By the way, there's a, re there's a special re re resurrection that will take place. I'm not going to discuss that because Revelation talks about it. And whether it's Barbara or Byron or I, at some stage, we will talk, talk into that. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. Now, who said this? Who said, the old Jesus is coming with clouds? And every eye will see him. Even they will pierce him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Who said it? No. 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 Now, he makes sure in the next verse that you understand Jesus God. So let's read the next verse. Verse 8. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That is the me. And the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, scripture is just one. Can you see the relationship between Dad, God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Can you see the relationship? It's amazing. It's just an amazing relationship. Okay. Let's, let's move on. <clears throat> um, to describe Jesus' coming, John uses wording from Daniel chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 12, and Matthew chapter 24. And I want you to, to see that because remember, uh, Revelation is the place where everything is dropped in and stays. Okay? All right. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13. It says, coming with the clouds of heaven. Daniel 7, 13. Yeah, I just, I, I put that on, on the, by the way, I took just that portion of the, of the verse. That's great. Okay, there's the, there's, the, there's the screen. Thank you very much, Joe. Daniel 7, 13 provided coming with the clouds of heaven. Zechariah 12, 10 provides whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. Okay? John also uses words of Jesus from his discourse on the Mount of Olives. Matthew 24, 30 says, coming on the path of heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So this is not only God saying it in Revelation. This is scripture that has been written throughout you know throughout the rest of the Bible in this case uh, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament it is important to note that John uses wording from the Old Testament and from Jesus sermon because he wants us to understand that Christ's coming is rooted in biblical prophecy as well as Christ's promise to come again the language used here points to a special resurrection of certain people immediately before the return of Christ. And as we said, we will be discussing that. But can you see how the Bible intertwines the Old Testament with the New Testament, the Gospels in the New Testament with the fifth Gospel, which is Revelation, all intertwined. The message of the second coming of Christ is the keynote of the book of Revelation. It opens and closes the book. It is the climax, climax of prophecy 
And the point that history moves toward Christ's coming in glory will mark the conclusion of this world's history and the beginning of God's eternal kingdom. The promise to come again is restated by Jesus three times in the conclusion of the book. We're talking about Revelation. What's, what's the last chapter? Chapter 22. So let's go to chapter 22. Let's go to verse 7, verse 12, and verse 20. So, Revelation 22, 7. This is what Jesus says. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12, 22, 12. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, who testifies to these things? Jesus. And the Father, through Jesus, Jesus testifies. Surely I am coming quickly. Remember, it's Jesus talking. So he says, I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Please note that in the New Testament, Christ always refers to his coming with the words, I am coming. Did you see in those verses? I am coming. He didn't say, I will come. He didn't say, I have come. He says, I am coming. This is profound, really very important. I am coming. The futuristic present hence refers to the future event as if it is already occurring. And in essence, he isn't yet coming, but he's coming. And why is he coming? Because he's providing you the prophetic message that will bring him. Revelation is really a prophetic function that says he's coming. Watch, pay attention. This is what's happening. He's going to come. He's coming. So there is no such thing as, well, you know. I'm okay being in battle for another 30 years. Uh, I don't know that, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to matter. And just as I, and just as the doctor says, you know, Victor, you, you've got a little cancer, and you may only live for another six months, then I'll do that, and I'll just keep myself to die. It's not, it's not that way. The reality is it says, I am happy. I'm quickly. You can read the word in Revelation. I'm coming quickly, says the Lord. I'll come quickly. That's very important. So, the, um, and then of course, if you remember reading um, the 2220, it says, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. This is powerful stuff. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes on this. The certainty, the certainty is affirmed with the statement, yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. You see, in Greek, it reads, Nai Ama. Nai is a Greek word that means Amen. A Hebrew affirmative. When Nai Amen are combined, the two words express an emphatic affirmative, which means Amen. 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 It's an affirmation. And what does amen mean? Be it. Be it. Be so. Be it. The affirmative or this affirmation given to us by Jesus, as well as read in Revelation chapter 20 and 22, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, also concludes the, the book of Revelation. It's the end of the book. This text, text refers to the literal and personal coming of Jesus in majesty and glory. In this way, Revelation is in line with the teachings of the rest of the Bible. Nowhere does the Bible teach 
uh, an invisible and, sec and secret coming of Christ. There are some religions that preach that. Nowhere in scripture does that exist. Nowhere. Not in Genesis, not in Revelation, not in the other 64 books. Nowhere. Okay. So, uh, where was I? Almost lost. So, uh, yes, okay. Um, while his coming brings deliverance, while Jesus' coming brings deliverance to the ones waiting for him, it will also bring judgment to those who rejected and disdain his mercy and love. And, and we will be talking in Revelation a, a little bit more about that. So yes, it's deliverance, but it's also judgment. The certainty of the second coming is rooted in the fact that it has been promised. Why should I believe it? Because it's been promised. Why sh sh should I expect it? Because I have been promised that there is a second coming. Okay. So um, as, uh, as we read in Revelation 1.8, by God himself, the great I am, and I'm, I'm going to, to read what I have on my notes. Uh, and by the way, uh, Re Revelation 1.8 was written by God himself, the great I am, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty, God the Father. That promise from God the Father is a promise as strong as the person himself. Who's stronger than God? Nobody. So when he says that we are coming, and we are coming for you, that promise is strong. It is as certain as the integrity and the ability of the person. It is God. It is God's in integrity at stake. It's important. In the Bible, the promise to come again is given by God, who in the past has kept all these promises. When God promises, you can be assured 100% that that promise will be fulfilled. God has provided us with an assurance that his promise to come back will be fulfilled just as all his promises have been fulfilled. In the past. The promises that God made. Are the keynotes of the book of Revelation. The promises that God. Is interceding on your behalf. And the promises that he's going to be here soon. To take us home. As his people. To live with him forever. Are a significant portion of Revelation. And as we study this book. You'll see this unfold it more and more. It's the keystone. So what's the keystone? It's a promise that God has made for you. In gone, Victor. Hold on to me. It's going to be tough. But if you trust me, we will go through it together. I'm almost there. You will see the signs. When they happen, you will know that I'm at the door. Hold on. Just trust me. Have faith in me. I'm at the door. Thank you. I don't know if there are any questions. I know that uh, it was one hour and 44 minutes. Yeah, Brian, I saw a hand. Brian, go ahead. Quick question on the verse Matthew 24 30. Yes. Where it ends, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Yes. And in the beginning, it says, coming on the clouds of heaven. So it's talking about Jesus coming, right? Yes. But so the mourning is about the people that did not believe in him? Yes. You, you, you've, got, uh, you, you've got your a very beautiful picture in this verse. Mm -hmm. You got a picture of the people that crucified Christ being resurrected to witness his coming. You've got the people that have reject, rejected Christ 
asking the rocks to destroy and kill. And as they do that, they really crying their armor. There is this thing. And then you've got the people of God waiting. And they rejoice. There's all sorts of things up, uh, around you. There's earthquakes and hail. And all the things happening as the Lord is coming down. And the believer, he's looking at God and rejoicing with his God and saying, Thank you, Lord, I'll be willing, I'll be willing. And none of the calamities fall upon, upon the believers. By the way, we will, we will go through all that. But that's the picture. So the tribes kind of get returned to the kingdom. Yes. Well, every one of you. There's people, tribes, and tongues like the oceans in Revelation represents the entire populace. So it really represents the world. But all those that have not believed and accepted. Because when the brightness of his glory hits you, it's kind of not pleasant if you're not sealed in God. One of, one of the things that we're going to get into is go ahead. I was just thinking it's because of the shame. Yeah. The shame kills you. Sure. You know, Jesus takes sure. the pain and yeah. you carry it yourself. But yeah. one, of, one, of the, one of the things that we're going to get into in the seven last plagues is when the plagues hit, yeah. or, mm-hmm. they don't, well, no, but the, those against God do not repent. They right. can they they actually get angrier and curse God. Right. They harden their hearts even more. They right. harden their hearts even more. Read read the, the read the plagues. But it's a beautiful thought to know that it will be sound for us all. Correct. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's not like oh yeah, I'm better than you. That's correct. No. That's, That's like correct. I wiped away every Perfect. fear later. No. I need to know, I need to know what we were saying. It could be the more it could be some way that it could be happening. Like if they have been wide to make it, one of make it, I don't you know, including the shame of the scene to keep doing it. Yeah. Now um I uh, it'll be it'll be good for 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 uh any any other question, feel free to ask. We will be ready to, to answer. Actually, I love the verse, though, in, um, in verse 8, because it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, yeah. the Father, right? Who is and who was and who is to come. So he's here now. Whenever you're reading this, he's been here before. Right. And he'll be there in the future. Right. Which means it just kind of reasserts his eternalness, but also his eternalness and his association with us. Right. Because Jesus prayed that we would be one with them. Right. Even Jesus right. himself said, let them be one with you and me and me and them that we can be one. Right. God never walks away from us. We walk away from him. But so that we'll go over another he was sent. Right. He says that they can be one. They can love the way that I love. And the world will right. go. Correct. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the high priestly prayer in John 17. Right, yeah, and so. I never thought of a high priestly prayer, but certainly. It is, yeah. Katia. Katia? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, my ending was rewriting the question given to you. I, have, I had you write questions as we go along. You can ask questions if you go along. Right, well, you can if ask. You have, if you have a question you want to ask, that we need to research, yeah, go ahead and ask it. Okay, uh, my answer, because I was reading the alone. Got six mountains, and we're talking seven. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, all I can tell you is is uh, what is published universally about the geography or the geographic area of Rome is seven mountains. Oh, as it's characteristic of seven months. As it gets into this, though, and I don't want to steal yeah. someone's thunder later, right. but what does a mountain symbolize? And I'm going to give you a hint. You think of the vision with Daniel, right? And all those kingdoms are wiped out and a huge mountain grows in place of them. So what does that mountain symbolize? God's kingdom, I heard someone say. So mountains symbolize kingdoms as well, just so right. in the Bible. Just so, just a little foreshadowing. Right. But, but physically, it, it is also appropriate for, for that area. Actually, he's going to disagree with me. Yeah. Yes. 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 That we can ask again. 
the, the majority of the group yes, wanted yes. Fridays. Right. Yes. Correct. And this will always be on Zoom. It will also be on YouTube so we can come back to it if we miss a Friday. Well, that's a little tricky. <laughs> we haven't quite got the technical part of that down. We are recording it tonight. So right. tonight is an experiment. If it works and we can put it on on uh, YouTube. YouTube, we will. That would be good. And it yeah. wasn't be the same thing. Yeah, no, of course not. Because I'm thinking if we're gone, we'll right. Back. Oh, it's absolutely we'll right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this, this is the church's Zoom link, so right. It will go to the church office and then to to uh, jail. I I wanted to uh, for my for for my sake and for all of us. I mean, this was the first evening, and notice that we have been married and committed to. Planned, planned, planned revelation, which really means that the preparation means that chapter. Yeah. Are you with me? You can't read that at a time. Way better to through it. I've read this. I'm like to do this thing. Right, right, right. So, so, well, that's why you have it now. So, right. you're going to want to read chapter two for next week. Next week. And which and, is the vision of the risen Christ, Revelation 9, 1, 9 through 20. Right. Yeah, so we've only gotten through the first half of Revelation 1 tonight. That's exactly right. right. No. no. Oh, chapter 1. Chapter 1 in the book. So, right. Yeah, but it's not so. Just, so let me, let me ask you. This is chapter two. Not a Bible in the plain revelation book. That's 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 right. what we said. We've yeah. only well, yeah. even in the Bible, we've only gone through the first eight verses. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so let me ask you a couple of other, other questions. Uh -huh. Obviously, obviously, the commitment means hour and a half, two hours. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah we add this Friday. Okay. okay. Can we have heat in this room? Yes. Yeah, I, I've got a heater up here, and I should have turned it on, and I didn't, but I will next time. We will. And, and now that we all are been here once, we'll keep the door closed too, yeah. so that it'll stay warmer. Right. right. The, the third question that I wanted to ask is this: You will notice that I've been very faithful to the book. So the question is: Does it help to have somebody here taking what the book has? And rearranging it and delivering it. Okay, all right. I just want to. Okay. Um, the the other thing too that we're committed to in this is when there is uh, when there are other thoughts, we're willing to discuss those on, on different topics. Different, yeah. Like he has an opinion of who the hundred and forty four thousand are. There are other people who have different opinions of who the 144,000 are. So we will talk, we will share those different perspectives. Provided it's all based on the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Provided it's biblical. Over the last video, he kept thinking about what is this called about Jesus? Yeah. Because yeah. if we don't come out of this knowing that it's about who he is more, yeah. because just knowing who he is more right. changes it. Oh, right. And Yvonne, just because you look at the prophecies God has before, right? And you see that they come true. So if God said it was going to happen, it happened. That's the basis for trusting God now. Because if he didn't lie before, if he came through, That's why all wouldn't he? Yeah. Just to get through today. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep, yep. Awesome. I'm, I'm okay, just delighted. Take, okay. Take your cards with you as you think of things. Yeah. If you think of questions during the week, write them down and bring them back with bring your book. It. Um, because we'll we'll be happy to to make every attempt to answer them. Right. Between all of us in this room, we've got a lot of good brains here. We can figure it out. Right. Oh, if you want it, oh, you can write your prayer requests on there and leave them in the back, and we'll be praying for your prayer requests as well. Okay. There's I'm, a whole stack back there. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pray. I just want to thank you again for being here. I'm gonna invite you if you can. To be here at 9.15 tomorrow morning. We have a wonderful Sabbath school class. And the subject is going to be about debt. Mm -hmm. Debt. debt. D no, no. D-E-B-T. Right. Financial debt. 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 Financial debt.
and uh, spend some time with us, you always welcome. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we are just delighted to be able to open the Bible, open Scripture, and to read about you. And to read not only about you um, as our God, as our Father God, to read about Jesus, the Son God, and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, not only what you're all about, but what you're all about regarding us. What an incredible delight to know that in the Trinity, in you, and Jesus, through what you did on earth when you came to earth, we will be called children of God, heirs, heirs of the kingdom. What a privilege. I'm looking forward to that. Father, give us a good night's rest. rest. Be with everyone here as they go home. Lord, I know that some people will be thinking about some of the things that were said. Father, open their minds to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Provide the explanation. And Lord, just as you do say to everyone, grace and peace, shalom. We want to say to you, Lord, thank you for your grace. And the peace that is derived from your grace and Father, shalom. Have a wonderful Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. By the way, the, the text, having the text in line so we can look them up is very helpful. Okay, is that good? Because if that's good, I will, I will continue to do it. I don't know. Yeah, let's stop this. Okay. It would go a little slower so that you could tell us. No, correct. Time. Yeah, that's the reason I did it, Michelle. I didn't. <laughs> I'm building mine on PowerPoint, so I guess I give you my PowerPoint, print out my PowerPoint slides. I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.